We want to begin by inviting one of our uh, charter members, Dr. Georgia Stewart McDade, to introduce how AWA became. But first, I'd like to actually introduce her since she's going to go right into her first, uh, she's going to be our first storyteller for the evening. So Georgia Stewart McDade loves reading and writing. She grew up writing and producing plays for the youngsters in her neighborhood and collaborated with church youth to write plays for special occasions. As a charter member of African American Writers Alliance, she began reading her stories in public in 1991. She credits the group with making her write poetry. For a number of years, she has written poems inspired by artists at such sites as Gallery 110, Seattle Art Museum, Columbia City Gallery, and Onyx Fine Arts Collection. For several years, Georgia wrote for Pacific Northwest Papers, especially the South, uh, the South District Journal, she continues to write reviews and interviews for community radio stations, and she is working on two biographies and poetry. Copies of her four volumes of poetry called Outside the Cave and her first collection of probes, observations and revelations, stories, sketches, sketches and essays can be found on her website. Dr. McDade. Thank you, Noni. Thank you, everyone who's here the readers, and especially our guests. I see a number of friends out there, so thank you. The African American Writers Alliance was founded in 1991 by what I describe as the feisty, always in control, uh, in control Randy Eddings. Reddings grew up in, uh, Eddings grew up in California where there were a number of writers groups with African Americans in them. She came here, young adult could not find one and leave it to Randy to say, okay, I'll make one. So she put an ad in the Seattle Times. A number of us showed up back in February, 1991, and we've been doing this ever since. So we invite everybody, whether you are have never written anything, just thought about it, or maybe you haven't thought about it, or you have written, you have published, you're self-published, it doesn't matter. I think it's very important that we tell our stories and the African-American Writers Alliance allows you to tell your story your way. Thank you very much. Check out our website, okay? I know it's in the chat or it soon will be. Now, okay, this is very interesting. I didn't get stuck on Whidbey Island, but I got back too late to get to my house, so. I am telling this story from the Salmon House, okay? Uh, but it's it's good. Don't have any notes or whatever, just tell you the story. When I went to college, uh, I grew up in Monroe, Louisiana. And when I went to college, uh, that first day was the farthest I traveled from home. That was about 200 miles. I didn't think a whole lot about traveling. Uh, I didn't know anybody who had traveled, a few relatives who came from California on occasion. And then I learned so much in college, so many ways, and I'm not talking about academics. I took a lot of humanities classes, and all of these places I'd seen in books on TV, I'd never been. And quite truthfully, it didn't occur to me that, ha-ha, I could go. These other people could go, so I could go. Then I got this job that I thought was the best thing in the world, teaching at Tacoma Community College. And more and more, I thought, hmm, maybe. It so happened there was a young woman working in the office who had uh, been on a trip and she had to make copies for me. So she'd make a copy and she'd come back and she said, oh, I saw this on our trip. And a few days later, she'd come running to my office. She said, I saw this too. And she just kept doing it. She said, you ought to go on the trip. And I thought about it. I can't go on a trip, you know? And anyway, she just, she would bring me these things. She had seen a picture of the Taj Mahal or a napkin from Shakespeare, Shakespeare's birthplace, something from a, a palace, you know, just, okay. So, I decided, why not? When I found out that you could go on a 47-day trip for $2,300, yes, this was a long time ago, uh, I decided that I would go. And one of the things I did on this trip uh, was get more confidence about going on other trips. So 
not only did I stay 47 days with the group, I spent two weeks by myself. I went to Spain and Greece. I said, I don't want this to, I don't want to miss Spain and Greece. So I just went by myself and I really, really felt good. One of the men who had been on this trip with me uh, with Skagit Valley Community College uh, went on a trip around the world, uh, probably three, six months later. And he said, you know, you ought to do this. You know so much. And he, he just wanted to see the pyramids. He sent me this postcard. So between his telling me I should go and this young woman showing me all of these things, I decided in 1985 that I would go on the six month trip around the world. I made my itinerary, I saved my money and whatever. I joined a group called Servaf. It's um, located on the home bases in uh, New York. As far as I know, it still operates. Anybody can join. You pay a fee, send them a one page bio with your picture on it. And then there are all of these people all over the world who are members. And so you get to, you send them a letter and they will let you live at their house three nights and you don't have to pay. So I wrote everywhere I was going. I had about, oh, 25, 26 countries I was going to. So I wrote these letters to these people and whatever. And uh, one of the places I ended up going was Singapore. And you may laugh, it's okay. I wanted to go to Singapore because there's this hotel there called Raffles. And Hemingway and other writers hung out there. And even then I considered myself a writer. I've been writing since I was about third grade. So I wanted to go. So one of the places I chose to stay was called Sam's Guest House. So I went to the landlord and I told him I wanted to go to Raffles. And he said, uh, oh, that's not too far. You, you can walk over there. So he gave me the directions and I was going out the door and this man came running behind me, really tall, slender man. And he said, excuse me. He said, I, I understand you, you're going to Raffles. Would you like some company? Well, I'd seen him in the guest house on a cage. And then I thought, what the heck, you know? So he stopped abruptly and he said, uh, I can't afford anything but um, dessert. <laughs> I said, well, okay, you know. So we went, he introduced himself. He was, he was a writer too. So he knew some of the same stories I knew. We just had a really, really good time. And um, I looked at the menu and I said, you know what? I can't afford anything but dessert either. So we had a really great laugh. We must have been there about two hours and then went back to the hotel. And I didn't, I didn't talk to him anymore. He was in the morning for breakfast. I might wave, he'd wave at me or whatever. And uh, we exchanged addresses and I didn't really think about him anymore. And um, I must have had at least two more months of my trip to go. And I got home, I had all of this mail, six months of mail. Lo and behold, there was a letter from this man. And uh, my name is Georgia, my middle name is Lee. And he was convinced I'm related to Robert E. Lee. So he always put Georgia Lee Stewart, my maiden name, uh, McDade on these letters. And the first letter must have been about 10 pages, single space typed on onion skin paper. The longest letter he wrote me was 17 pages, typed onion skin paper. He would tell me about American history. I'm sure he knew more than I did. I remember the monitor and the Merrimack, but I didn't know which side I was on. He loved in the heat of the night. He loved, um, what is it, Law and Order. I had never seen Law and Order. I didn't want to see any TV show called Law and Order, but he wrote about it all. And he'd write these letters, but he'd upset me because he would call the Japanese Japs. So I would write back and say, please don't call them Japs. Jap Japan Jap Japanese is the word you're supposed to use. He would write back, I know what you mean, but you don't know them, I know them. And he would continue to call them Japs. So I wouldn't answer. <laughs> then he would, we would he would write about politics or whatever, you know. And this was in 85, I got the first letter from him. And this letter writing went on. I would have written him more often, but he really annoyed me uh, with the slurs he would use. And he could always explain why he was doing it. 85 now. Then in 2005, I received 
a letter from Australia. I didn't tell you he's from Australia. And he wrote for a magazine comparable to what we would call car and drive. So I would send him um, calendars with cars or whatever. But I, I saw this, didn't even think about this man, although this letter said Australia. I opened the letter and it said that uh, he had died and uh, he had left me a legacy of $10,000. The uh, executor of the will was out of the country. This was in May and the, exec the executor would not be back until September. So I remember, I didn't tell anybody, I, oh, you know, okay, all right. Uh, I recognized his name or whatever. Lo and behold, in September, I got this check. So I ran, got the last letter I had received from him. And at the bottom of the letter, the last paragraph in the last letter said, uh, it warms my heart that I know somebody in the world who does as much good as you do. Um, enjoy your life, something to uh, that effect. And of course I had known he was ill. Uh, I knew he didn't get along with his sister. His parents, you know, just little things like that, but I couldn't understand why he would be giving me this $10,000, but I deposited the check. It was good. So that's it. That's it. That is one of my favorite, favorite memories. I still have the letters. I have a friend who says I should publish the letters. And you never know what, ha what can happen if you just say hi to somebody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>